Yeah, my name is Mark Quinsland, and um, this presentation is on the top 10 trips, tips for evaluating benchmarks. And I'm a senior field engineer with Neil in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I, really, I have the best job in the world. I absolutely love this job. It's um, The best parts of my job are, are working with talented engineers on challenging problems at really cool companies all over the world. But this is a lightning talk, so let's get started. Okay, tip number 10. To paraphrase Mark Twain, there are lies, there are damn lies, and there are benchmarks. And I'm going to turn off my camera because I'm being informed that I have limited bandwidth, so my apologies. Okay, all right. To paraphrase Mark Twain, there are lies, damn lies, and benchmarks. And uh, benchmarks are really a special form of statistics. They can be a, a wonderful tool for evaluating hardware and software, but they can also um, uh, be used for for ill, for for um, for, and they be compromised by bad actors, either intentionally or not. This includes weaponizing statistics, reading test conditions, procedures, lack of transparency, sloppy execution, lying by omission. Sometimes it's blatant favoritism, and, and I have seen these, all of these, in, in one form or another, in, in different different situations. Okay, number nine. When you're evaluating benchmarks and results. And you see a flawed study, be kind. You know, don't don't assume that they're evil, that there's evil intent. So this is Robert Hanlon's uh, uh, razor. He says never attribute to malice that which can be adequately explained by stupidity. I think that's a little bit harsh. So my my mind is a little bit simpler. It's like be skeptical but not cynical. Really, they're they're you know they're they're most likely unless it's being done by the marketing team. They're probably not trying to be evil with this. Okay. So tip number eight, understanding the difference between a real benchmark study and a bake-off. Well, benchmarks are usually well-designed evaluation processes for a single product. Some have published specifications or open source code. The best have a wide variety of tests that can be evaluate, can use, be used to evaluate both simple operations and complex realistic workloads. Well-documented procedures should lead to auditable, repeatable results. Bake-offs, on the other hand, are commonly used to compare two or more technologies for use in a given environment. They're usually less formal because they're tailored to a specific project or an environment. They can be much less rigorous. And sometimes uh, we've seen it where bake-offs are run with the... Um, Mark, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, people are asking us to put on a slideshow view, please. Can you please do so? So they can see it better. Mark, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm that? sorry. Let's go. Let's continue. No worries. OK, so um, when you see a competitive benchmark, um, these are a special situation. They're, um, and you have to take extreme care when you're, when you're looking at them because you, you can really introduce bias. Ideally, you're running these on an identical infrastructure with uh, similar data and procedures. The biggest thing is you want to make sure you're using the best and latest versions that are available. You're not trying to use a community edition uh, for testing. This is um, a common mistake, and uh, we'll, we'll be talking about another benchmark that's that's in here, where they essentially um, took the community edition version of Neo and used it for the comparison. This is to use a sports analogy. This is using the 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 um, this is using the junior varsity team, and it's it's just not designed for, for that type of thing. Also, what you want to do when you're doing a competitive benchmark is you want to rely on experts for help with configuration and best practices, tuning inquiries, and so on. So there are experts out there. So you're trying to get a, take a look to see how these products are going to work in your environment. Um, that requires like setting them up and doing a real test. Get experts in there. Look at their best practices and tuning. If you, if you try to do this with just a little bit of knowledge about it, you're going to fail, as we'll see in a minute. OK, always read the fine print. So look for the clues in the benchmark results. This is a gold mine. This is typically where people will put their limitations with the things that they did, the corners that they cut. Um, you, you can't assume that these 
tests are being done with professionalism um, or an objectivity. This is really where they where they describe, hey, this is what we did, and this is how we did this, and this is how we did this. And you take a look to see, does that really apply to me? Is that useful? Is that bogus? So, so um, am I using uh, published data sets or these kind of uh, uh, set up in a, in a certain way that would favor one situation versus another. So always read the fine print. It's amazing what you can find in there as far as um, how to how much to trust the results, whether you should trust the results at all. Okay, tip number five. Speaking of fine print, look at the fine print to find out if you're even allowed to run a benchmark. You might not be able to based upon the DeWitt clause. So if you're not familiar with it, the DeWitt clause was the result of a benchmark that was being done against Oracle. And Larry Ellison saw this and he got furious about it and said, hey, you can't use our, our, our software in, um, uh, in benchmarks anymore. So they created the very first uh, restriction against benchmarking that I know of. But it's, it's not unusual now uh, to, to do this. And it, it's ironic because Oracle has this DeWitt clause, but they also or they don't shy away from using benchmarks, as we'll see in a minute. Okay, number four, tip number four, uh, is the data model optimized? Well, this is really critical. So if you're, if you're familiar with NEO and you are familiar with graphs, you know that graph data modeling is, is, uh, is it's an art and a science. It takes a lot more skill than to just do a uh, relational database approach data modeling job. Uh, where you have second normal form, third normal form, and so on. So with Neo, the graph data model can really influence how your how your uh, graph works. So I teach graph data modeling a lot for Neo. It's one of my favorite classes to teach. And typically, we'll we'll talk about options. You could do this and do this, and you understand the difference between the words can and should. Um, and you want to test these things out at scale. So you something that might work at happy path with low volumes is, is possibly not going to work when you have larger volumes. The beauty of a benchmark is you get to look at it and the people, it's open source, that are out there, it's published, you, you know what's going on. But um, sometimes the, the ben data models are not optimized. And so if unless you take care to optimize them in, during the actual testing, you're going to get creamed by, by poor results. So in this particular example, this Images from the LDBC data uh, data standards, and they are. Um, it was almost great. I mean, they're really. It was. It was almost good. But the choice of of putting the attributes uh, for the country um, as as attached nodes that's fine for small volumes. But when you start looking at billions of nodes um, and billions of relationships, this optimize. You can you can see how how poorly optimized this model is. So I would give this model. Um, uh, uh, not a passing grade based upon that. Again, it, it's fine at, low, at small volumes, but not really at scale. Okay, tip number three. Um, I love this cartoon, um, Robert. Um, but this is this is what I think of when people start saying, hey, we tested for this, we tested for this. What are you testing for? How well do these evaluation metrics meet your KPIs um, are they applicable at all? And we, we just finished a bake off with a with a large company. They did a great study. They're using LDBC and all of this stuff. None of which matched their KPIs. But they were like, okay, no, this is good. We want to see how, how this performs. But it really was kind of a pointless exercise because it didn't really meet what they're trying to do. So look at the fine print again. How's the performance being measured? Can the results be gamed? Not that people would do that, but you know, engineers are pretty clever. There are there are some benchmarks like LDBC that I, allow you to do something like um, uh, a um, materialized view, where you might ha take a shortcut and save off the results and pre pre calculate things. And so this is this is possible to do. So take a look to see can they game it? Um, or can you trust the results? And hopefully, the things that you're looking for, the the KPIs that you're interested in are being evaluated with metrics that are applicable, that are tested, that are, that and you have open source, you can look to see what are they testing, why, um, and hopefully it's driving the right behavior from the engineers to create better products, not just try to gaming, gain the, uh, the benchmark. Okay, tip number two, 
academic studies. So they're not immune. And I, I wish I could say that they were, but uh, I, I love um, uh, some of the academic studies that I've seen, and I hold them to a higher regard than I do for um, uh, than something like produced by the marketing department. But um, this one is from a, a paper that was uh, released by uh, a university here in California, and it was just sloppy. Um, that's I'd like to say that it was it was um, better done, but you can see the the blue boxes here. This, these are cut and paste errors. They're, they're, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. They're, these are cut and paste errors. But the, what the res, so the result is is that for some of these very simple queries, the numbers are absurd. And nobody checked to see if the numbers were absurd. But unfortunately, these results have been taken and cited by lots of people and used to justify uh, just unbelievably ridiculous claims. So so it's, it's a pretty bad, uh, uh, pretty sloppy uh, presentation of the results. But the test setup was really bad. So this is where they, they use the community version of, of NEO. Well, if you're not familiar with it, the community version has a single threaded processor for handling queries, where enterprise version has has a um, uh, very performant um, multi uh, uh, parallel processing for this. And so it's just designed for different kinds of tests. So that alone invalidates this test. I mean, it's, it's again, you're comparing the the junior varsity team to to a varsity team. And that's really it's it's just ridiculous. Um, assumption, but also the queries themselves. So they were right, using uh, queries that they wrote, and they're they're okay. Uh, they test out okay at small volumes, but again, they fail at large volumes and they fail at large scale. So you could come to the conclusion that Neo can't do the query, or you could also come to the conclusion that hey, you need to write better queries. So always ask the experts, which they did for the one of the vendors. So the one vendor was supplying. Uh, hand-tuned uh, compiled queries and against unoptimized uh, queries running on Neo. So just the way it was approached was was uh, really, really pretty bad there. Uh, and again, they also didn't fix the data model errors. So so, so they're, they're running against this, this data model where there's, there are billions and uh, 25 million um, unnecessary relationships to some, some nodes and they're trying to process this uh, with a single threaded processor in Neo. And so the execution time is going to be way up because that's not how parallel processing works best. Um, so anyway, they use suboptimal queries. Uh, we, we, they, they could have come to us and say, hey, this is what we do. We would have optimized them. We could have compiled them, done store procedures. Then there'd be an apples to apples comparison. So again, poor comparisons, uh, wrong version of, of the software, cut and paste errors, and a, a poor data model. So, okay, the only thing worse than use, doing a paper like this is relying on it if you're a big company like Oracle. So tip number one. So rather than redoing these experiments themselves, they decided to just reuse the paper from UC Merced and with all of its errors and everything. So so really, if, if you're trying to save time and money, this is clearly not the way to do it. So because what you're doing is you're risking being branded with the same level of incompetence. Um, and, um, you know, that it's ironic because the restriction against Oracle for, for benchmarking, but uh, maybe they assume that Neo had had the uh, same kind of restriction against doing it, but they should have done their own work. So basically what they did was they put their own name on somebody else's incompetent paper. So um, with that, I'm going to realize that I have one minute to spare and um, we'll take questions. Let me look at the comments that are going in here and see what we got. Do we have a course on graph modeling uh, at, at Graph Academy? Yes, we do. Uh, we teach it all the time, uh, but it's also available from Graph Academy. Um, super nodes are nodes within with a huge number of relationships. Um, huge is a is a um, uh, you know how big is how big is huge? It's like how big is the ball of string? How well you plan for it? So um, you know clearly something with 25 million nodes. Um, is going to be a problem for any database to um, so, so join with 25 million queries. Uh, thank you, Michael, for posting this. Okay, uh, is there a particular benchmark that you've seen with respect? Think was particularly well done. 
All things considered, the LDBC benchmark is still the best one that's out there. If, if it's used correctly, the problem is, is a lot of people do bake-offs using parts of it, and they'll cherry-pick it and say, hey, we're going to use parts of this. So the LDBC is a good starting point, but it's, it's, it's not there. But any benchmark is going to cut some corners because that's the way the world works. It's just that's why you read the benchmark and say, hey, which corners did you cut on this particular version? Um, I think we're done.